Who is Jesus? I think it's one of the biggest questions that we can possibly ask. Jesus is in fact the center of Christianity. Jesus is the character. He is the man that divides Christianity from any other religion in the world. And before we can even go into the story of God or understanding anything more about the Christian faith, at some point we have to ask ourselves this question. Who do we think that Jesus is? If I just told you that my friend Dave um, had a great story and I'm going to share that story, you wouldn't actually care a great deal about the story, even if it was a great story, because you've got no idea who Dave is. And therefore to you, you can't relate to Dave. And because you don't know who Dave is, then the story doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's the same with the Christian faith. We so often go diving into the Christian faith without first just saying to ourselves, well, who is Jesus? Who is this central character? If we can understand that, we can build from that. Jesus acts as the launch pad. And if any of you have just started your Christian faith and you're on that journey, if you can establish in your head who you think Jesus is, it's one of the biggest questions that you'll answer. It's not something that we can answer in full in a short period of time, but hopefully over the next few minutes, I can set up some questions and give you some foundations so that at least you're asking the right questions. Indeed, while Jesus was on earth, he turned to his closest friends at one of the points and he basically just said, who do you say that I am? Because even at the time that Jesus was alive, there were murmurings, there were rumors about who Jesus was. Some just said he was a good teacher. Some people said that he was a prophet. And there came a point where Jesus brought the people that were closest to him and said, well, who do you say I am? And I think today that's the same question that we all need to answer. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter, perhaps Jesus' closest disciple, just simply answered him, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And that is, I think, where we need to start. Was Jesus God or was he demon possessed? Was he a good teacher? Was he a liar? Was he a madman? Was he brilliant? Was he insane? Was he a prophet or was he a blasphemer? I think these are all the questions that they were relevant 2000 years ago, but they're equally relevant now in our society, because if we cannot answer this question, then to me, what's the point of going any further? Time magazine famously stated that Jesus is the most persistent symbol of purity, selflessness and love in the history of Western humanity. So even in the secular world, we all know the name of Jesus. Some people just simply use him as a swear word, but to other people, it's so much more. And I think hopefully over these next few minutes, we can just unpack a little bit about who Jesus was. For a lot of people, Jesus might actually just simply be a fantasy. And I speak to a lot of people and they're like, well, it's, it's a fairy tale. Was Jesus even a real person? Is he just a symbol? Is he a symbolic figure? Well, actually, I think that to me is the wrong question to be asking, because even before we go anywhere near the Bible, which is an incredible collection of ancient sources, there's actually a number of references to Jesus outside of the boundaries of the Bible in secular literature of the time. And I think if we start there, then we can start to paint a picture of who this guy Jesus actually was. Tacitus was a famous Roman historian, and he actually, uh, he wrote what, what are called the Annals, which was basically a collection of histories. We don't have every single one of the books that he wrote, but we have some. But there's this amazing bit, um, which he's re referring to the fire of Rome in AD 64. So approximately 30 odd years after Jesus was said to have lived. And Tacitus, this historian, writes that Nero, who was the emperor of the time, actually pinned the guilt for the fire on the Christians. And he says in that bit, he says, to explain who Christians were, they based themselves on a person who they called Christ. And he said that this Christ was someone that suffered the ultimate punishment at the hands of the Roman Empire. And so even outside of the Bible, we have a Roman historian referring to a group of people known as the Christians based on a man called the Christ who suffered the ultimate punishment, which was known at the time to be crucifixion. And we can start to understand that actually Jesus was a historical figure as well as a religious fig figure. And that's where I really want to base this discussion from because Tacitus wasn't the only person that talked about who Jesus was. Pliny the Younger, who was a guy, he was a, a Roman governor in one of the Roman provinces. He wrote some letters to the Emperor Trajan in just after 100 AD, and he too describes this group of people called the Christians and mentions that they followed this man called Jesus. And he's asking, um, he's asking Trajan, the emperor, he's saying, what should we do with these people? They seem to follow this man's teachings and they're different from everyone else. And he just doesn't know, should we persecute them? Should we put them in prison? And so even in Pliny's letters, we then find that Jesus, again, we start to understand who his character was. And furthermore, the movement that he had started, which I think it befuddled the Romans at the time. They'd had a lot of people who had actually tried to say, I'm some sort of Messiah. I'm some sort of savior. I'm some sort of king or revolutionary that you should follow. But this Jesus seemed to, and we find in literature, this, this Jesus seemed to have caused more questions amongst the Romans than any other person at that time in history. Even amongst Jewish histor historians, so the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And yet Josephus, who was a first century AD Roman historian, he again writes about Jesus. He mentions Jesus's crucifixion. He even mentions that it was under Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor at the time. 
Only a century later, we find Greek satiricists, a guy called Lucian, mentioning Jesus and the Christians again. He's taken the mick out of them. Christians weren't popular at the time. They were seen often as revolutionaries or people didn't understand who they were and where they're from. But this, the one thing, or perhaps the collection of things that we can get from these writings, even before we touch the Bible, is that Jesus was seen of as some sort of wise man. He was seen as a teacher, somehow powerful, and he was revered by the followers around him. We see references to miraculous feats. We hear rumours of his miraculous feats even outside of the Bible. We know that he was crucified. We know that it was under Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor in Judea at the time. And crucially, we learn as well across all of this that he had a selection of followers that genuinely believed that he was some sort of Messiah, that he was sent from God. And it presents an interesting picture. It doesn't go the full way to what the Bible says. But what it does do, I think, and secular historians are even almost in unanimous agreement, there was a person. He was called Jesus. He lived approximately what we would say 0 AD to about 33 AD, give or take maybe three years either way. He was crucified. He was some sort of revolutionary. He taught. He started a movement. All of this comes from outside the Bible. So what does the Bible add? And I think even when we add the Bible into the mix, we should be careful to make sure that we don't um, say, oh, it's just the Bible. It's, it's a group of stories. It's a fairy tale. The Bible in itself is a collection of ancient sources. And of course, they have a bias. Of course, it was written by people that genuinely believed that Jesus was the Christ. But nonetheless, they are ancient sources that should be uh, respected or at least treated as equals with ancient sources around them. There was a famous theologian. He was called um, F.J.A. Hort. And he said this. He said, in the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the text of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose culture. And no secular historian would disagree with that decision. You see the text even in the New Testament that they have, the number of manuscripts we've got, the reliability of them. They actually, whether or not you believe that they are true, you cannot say that they are unreliable or say have been written in the third century AD or later or just been made up by a group of people starting, wanting to start a religion. This was written by people that genuinely believed that Jesus was the Christ. So what did they say? Well, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of things. And I think probably the one thing that I'd love to, for you to take from this little talk is that they declare that Jesus was God. Sometimes they refer to him as God. Sometimes they refer to him as the son of God. In Hebrews 1.3, we're told that Jesus was the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. Jesus was someone that actually taught us who God was because God to the Israelites before then had been a fatherly figure, yes, but had seemed distant. This sort of God that they sort of understood, but Jesus came and said, no, no, if you look at me, you've seen God. Jesus himself says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, which if he wasn't claiming to be the Son of God would be a blasphemous thing to say. It's essentially saying, look at me, I am God. And so if he wasn't God, as I say, maybe he would be insane. But what the Bible says is truth, is that Jesus actually was God. He was who he said he was. Paul himself, who was someone writing shortly after Jesus's time, described Jesus as the image of the invisible God. He is for us someone who we can relate to because he was fully human. He stood on this earth. He was tempted as we are tempted. He suffered sorrow as we suffer sorrow. He was hurt as we get hurt. We can relate to him. And yet he constantly points to himself and says, look, if you're looking at me, you're looking at God. And so beyond what the secular sources are saying, not just a wise teacher, not just a reverent man that started a movement, not just a revolutionary, but Jesus was actually someone that said, no, 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 I am the son of God. I am God himself come from heaven to earth so that you may understand who God is. You may learn who God is. And furthermore, as we're going to learn, the gospel message was going to do something that God alone could do, which would save humanity from sin. If you want to understand, okay, well, where does it say that Jesus was God? Well, Paul talks in Colossians and he says that in Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwelt bodily. And then in Philippians 2, he said, though Jesus was in form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but indeed emptied himself, suggesting that when Jesus was on earth, he was fully God and fully human. But his entire heavenly privileges, he actually said, no, no, I'm leaving them in heaven. When I come down to earth, I'm going to demonstrate to humanity what good God looks like in human form. In Hebrews 1, it says, in these last days. And so we're talking about the days of Jesus and then the days of the church. God has spoken to us through his son whom he appointed as the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of God's glory and the very stamp of his nature, upholding the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the stamp of God's nature. And while he was there on earth for 33 years before he died and rose again, we learn that Jesus, because he was God, actually existed before time and will exist after time. While he may seem while he was on earth a human and therefore in some ways weak, we actually learn from the Bible that when Jesus died and rose again, now he's back in heaven. He is actually up there in glory. 
And so the images that we so often see at Christmas of this weak, tiny baby Jesus are so often the ones that I think we need to challenge. Because if we're going to understand who Jesus is, we need to stop thinking of him as a baby human and start realizing that, yes, he was God, but yes, he came in human form. And so when Paul talks about this Apostle Paul, when he talks about Jesus being the Son of God, he's saying that Jesus is God. He's not some sort of spirit. He's not a figurehead of a religion. He's not some sort of, I don't know, souped up angel. He is, in fact, truly man and truly God. And so when we talk of Jesus as being the son of God, we're actually saying, no, no, he is God. He lived on this earth. And furthermore, n- not only did he live on this earth, he lived the perfect life. When he died and rose again, and this is exactly what we're going to be looking at in the sessions to come, he actually achieved something for humanity that we could not achieve for ourselves. But I think the worst thing that we can do is to dismiss Jesus out of hand because what society says or who society says that Jesus is. If there's one thing that we need to ask ourselves afresh, Every time we come to the Bible, every time we walk into church, it's that simple question. Who do you say that Jesus is? Because if we can answer that for ourselves, if we can actually get a conviction for ourselves on who Jesus is, the whole basis and the whole foundation of the Christian faith rests exactly on the answer to that question.